everyone, Charlie Webster here. Thanks so much for joining us for a new episode of My Sporting Mind. We're proudly supported by SportingLife.com, the home of expert analysis and insight for racing, football, golf, and so much more. Today, I'm really excited to welcome Britain's leading high jumper, Morgan Lake, to the podcast. Morgan. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great to see great to see you and thanks for joining us i know you just got back from training yeah <laughs> so my first question i'm going to go straight in because i how are you doing in terms of the fact that you had tokyo 2020 which i'm, I'm sure you've been asked and talked about a lot because obviously that was postponed and now it's hopefully 2021 hopefully. Um, but you, yeah hopefully but you also um just had the indoor championships postponed as well which you're yeah. training for um so how are you dealing with those goalposts shifting all the time yeah um it's been hard <laughs> it has been really hard I think last year it was also novel and it got to the point where you could see the pandemic was just getting worse and worse around the world and for me and I think a lot of athletes we were just like the Olympics has to be cancelled there's absolutely no way it can happen um, obviously we've trained so hard for how many years, four years since Rio, um, but we're like, at the end of the day, like public health is way more important and we'd rather do our part in, um, like keeping everyone healthy and safe. Um, then also the other side of it was like, once we found out we were going to be in lockdown, um, our training was in our back gardens. We had no access to track, no access to any facilities. And we were like, we're preparing to have the biggest competition of our lives and <laughs> our training is done in our back garden. We were just like, this is just not what the Olympics is about. It's not, it's meant to be a level playing field. Everyone um, able to train the kind of like the same conditions and have the same opportunities. And yeah, it just didn't make any sense that some countries are being completely locked down. Some people can even leave their houses. Whereas some people like in Australia say, um, have full access to training facilities. So. I think once that was um, announced and that was cancelled, well, postponed for the following year, we almost like, like, okay, this is all right. We're just going to have to lock down and just do whatever we can um, and just hope that we have a, a summer season. I think that's our first thing. We're like, oh, we might get some competitions in the summer. Um, that kind of happened in a way. And then we were like, right, everything is towards geared towards indoor season. So started indoor season well started my winter training which is never fun it's all the hard grass stuff like the hills the circuits the longer runs um but luckily enough we got back to our normal setups with like my coach and my training partners and physios and stuff so training this winter was great um and I was meant to open up my indoor season the Sunday just gone and two days before the championship or two days before the competition we got told that well, A, we got first, we got told that the British Championships were, were going to be cancelled. Um, they were set to be held in Glasgow on like the end of February. Um, so that was cancelled. And that was, it was funny because I was on the phone to my dad and I called him and I was like, Dad, um, they've cancelled the British Championships. And he was like, well, it's just like one of those things. It was probably going to happen anyway. And just had a long conversation about that. And then I hung up the phone. I was like, too far. I've still got a few more competitions left in the UK that's fine so hung up the phone um then I saw a tweet from England Athletics saying that they were cancelling their events and I was like oh I was like dad my second competition's been cancelled and he was like right okay it's fine you've still got one this weekend like just everything you can just treat it as a, as a championships um, and I was like okay came off the phone and then I got another email saying the competition this weekend had been cancelled as well I just I just lost it I was like it's just so hard training um for a goal which can just get taken at any minute and mm. it's one of the things we have never really had before I think beforehand you would do a competition say you were injured so you have this competition but that was kind of like on your back whereas this just feels like a bit of a help situation like at any minute it could be cancelled so yeah it's mm. been been hard <laughs> I can imagine it must be so frustrating and I know you were saying you're on the phone to dad and I mean I was smiling you were smiling but I can imagine in all seriousness, it, it yeah. wasn't really how you felt inside. What what was you? How did you feel? I suppose. I, so I, it was funny at the beginning because I was just like, "This is just a joke." Like, and then it got to the point a few hours later in the day, and I was I just like I was overcome with sadness because I was like, "I've 
prepared so well for these competitions and yeah. for them to just be cancelled um, was really hard, especially seeing a lot of other sports go ahead as planned in the UK. Um, obviously, I understand that like health and well-being and safety is the most of important course, thing, yeah. but it always it almost was like they hadn't thought of a plan B. I think that was the most frustrating thing that most of the athletes have seen. It's like we we train so basically the competition was meant to be in my training center which is they've made like they've tried so hard to make it a secure environment um and we have to have like temperature checks every day and questionnaires and covid tests so it's really really secure and that was where the competition was meant to be so we kind of thought it was definitely going to happen because they tried so hard to make it secure and yeah. it was like last minute just written off um so yeah that was quite disappointing quite sad and yeah I just had the weekend I was just like am I going to have an indoor season um I think especially in terms of training it's, it's hard as well because like I peaked to compete on Sunday and my body was ready to compete and it's yeah. like right okay now I can't so it's almost like I've missed a few sessions because I had a bit of a lighter training week so then my my coach was like well we have to do a mock competition on the on the Monday, which is it's great, it's fun, but it's it's not a competition. It's it's mm. not real. So yeah, at the moment we're just trying to trying to get some competitions planned. There are some competitions in Europe which I could go to, um, but the reason I'd chosen to do a UK season was because just to eliminate that risk of of traveling. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned peaking in performance because that's something I was so intrigued by because yeah. how on earth do you manage your peaking in the performance when your competitions are dropping and yet yeah. you said it in your own words that like you've got the biggest tournament of your life coming up yeah yeah it, it's really <laughs> yeah <laughs> like it's I mean I feel sorry for my coach as well I like obviously have to do our training program and he doesn't know when to push us um just in case we get told there's a competition all right we've just moved the competition to this weekend or when to like taper us off and back us off so that we can compete. Um, and that's a hard thing as well. And it's physically, but it's also mentally. Like I had so mentally prepared for this competition, seeing the visualizations every night and just really getting into the mode of, on to the competition mode. And for that to just be taken away, it, it was really hard. Cause I was just like, I put so much effort into getting myself like my mind and my body ready for this competition just for it to be cancelled so yeah I think that that was a really big part of it as well the emotional part of it. How do you make sure you reset that mindset then so you can compete in hopefully what's next and then hopefully Tokyo? Yeah um, so I've got a mental performance coach um, who I was introduced to by Red Bull and she's been an absolute godsend like <laughs> she's helped me so much um, especially like obviously during the pandemic and just keeping um yeah keeping myself motivated really um, mm. like a long time she kind of said obviously I put my I put so much effort in the last few weeks getting ready for my first competition um so she was like give yourself a weekend off just don't think about just don't think about next week don't think about the competitions coming up just like allow yourself to kind of like reset and just so I'm not all firing and just like yeah just getting anxious and getting like worried and just angry about things she was like just give yourself allow yourself to have a reset just like read a book and just get your mind away from like almost like the athlete brain um so that was really helpful and I kind of felt a lot more refreshed going into this week and just just kind of knowing that that competitions are going to happen hopefully at some point um yeah that was that was that was kind of the main thing it's just knowing that you haven't done all this work for no reason like there will hopefully be some, some competition soon yeah, because I can imagine it's so much pent, pent up emotion and you, you're yeah. getting your nerves ready, your adrenaline and everything you need to be able to do that competition. And then when it's not there, it's almost like, what do you do with that? You yeah. said like the, the athlete brain, yeah. <laughs> you kind of split the athlete brain and, you know, your personal brain up a yeah. little bit. Yeah, um, yeah, I do. I think that's one thing she taught me and it's been really helpful. Um, like, yeah, just kind of like not always being not just kind of responding to things in, in the same way, just kind of like having two kind of mindsets has been really important. I think it's quite, it's quite good to like, just when I'm looking over my sessions and stuff and um, like doing feedback and from sessions from competitions, I find that really useful. 
Are you quite hard on yourself then in terms of feedback? I've got better. Kind of nodded your head. Yeah. <laughs> when I was younger, it was um I was really hard on myself. Um, but I've definitely got better as the as the years have gone by, yeah. And what's the most important thing do you think the mind coach that you're working with, your performance mind coach, has implemented in you as an athlete firstly? Um, I think the most important thing has probably been um like to control the controllables and that's been like a really really big thing this year obviously when things aren't going to plan in terms of what you you can't things can't be going to plan um so it's yeah it's kind of reacting to things that I can control has been important so like the fact that this competition was cancelled um like obviously it's completely out of my control so it's like okay what can I do to make sure that I'm prepared and like in case there's another competition coming up so yeah that's probably been the most important thing that's actually something I use all the time Mm. in my in my life and I'm not a professional athlete anyway because I think it really helps to go okay I can't control this but but I can control you know how I train or how I get up the next morning or the mood I'm in and blah 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 Um, and what about the most important thing you think you've kind of put in your own personal life that she's helped you work through um again I don't want to say the same thing but again it is that same thing that it's being able to have control over over your life and not just reacting to things which like yeah I think reacting to things were the most important thing like I used to just react things quite quickly um and it's kind of yeah looking at the bigger picture and just um yeah controlling what I can yeah, do you, do you find that you you get anxiety or nerves around um, things that aren't in control? Yeah, I think so. Um, and yeah, in kind of like both the personal and athlete setting, I I find that. So um, yeah, like I always like to be the person to like say I've got a local competition. I'm like right, I want to drive myself there and just kind of prepare myself as much as I can. Um, so yeah, I think I've definitely definitely growing um, better with that as well and what about dealing with in things in competition where things don't go your way I remember watching you in Doha and then you know what I'm gonna say and and you basically I think you tore your number off and you could see how upset and annoyed and angry you were yeah you know what were you feeling through those moments and and what have you learned from that yeah Doha was a weird one um looking back at it like I'd had quite a turbulent year just those like, things that happened personally and in my like athletic career as well and looking back I'm like, oh, I wish I just wish I hadn't I hadn't gone to that competition so I really? put way too much pressure on myself to perform that competition where in hindsight I was definitely not in form or in shape to to be, probably even make the final so um yeah that was a weird one I think I reacted because I was just like already in that heightened emotional state where I was just yeah. like everything's just going wrong um but normally when competitions don't go to plan um yeah it, it is hard because obviously you put so much you put so much effort into competitions um but then looking back at all the competitions that probably haven't gone to plan um obviously not every single one but the majority of them I can kind of look back and think I probably wasn't best prepared for that competition um but that's something you don't really see in the moment um in the moment you think you think every single competition is going to go well um especially I definitely did when I was younger I just thought every competition I would get a PB um but yeah unfortunately it doesn't work that way <laughs> um and you you know you were saying about the ones that didn't always go that well what do you think you've learned along the way with those I mean if you when you look back at say Rio um which you did incredibly well at you got a PB there yeah. and then you look at Doha which is interesting because it's almost like you can put that into context now because you said you'd, you'd got other stuff going on in your life and yeah. you weren't best prepared you know what do you learn from those moments um I think so yeah even like looking back at Rio um I was just so I was just so happy to be there. I think I didn't put any pressure on myself. I was like, I just want, well, I did, I kind of did. I was like, I just want to go make the final, which obviously is pressurizing in itself, but. Um, but there was almost no expectation on you, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Um, whereas with Doha, 
I just put so much pressure on myself to, to perform. I think almost because I knew that I hadn't done the work for it. Uh, mm. just like, I just any, anything I can to get me through to that final and just kind of went in with quite like a tense um, attitude, like a tense, yeah, just, just been tense about it. Um, so I think I learned from both of those situations is as long as like you just know you've done everything you can do um, and obviously there's someone who's going to have injuries sometimes there's going to be reasons that you can't um, but just never going into competitions feeling like you're lacking um, because you've already put yourself down a level then um, so yeah just kind of like going into competitions and just thinking uh, right I've done everything I can do so just kind of enjoy it um, there's nothing more I can do now so just enjoy it and give it your best and just yeah just do whatever you can on the day how do you deal with that pressure and expectation because there's a there's a there's a lot of talk about kind of you and what what's expected of you and and this rising star and what we're potentially going to see in Tokyo yeah um yeah I just kind of I've definitely got a lot better at dealing with the pressure um and I guess the way of doing it is just like not thinking about it and just <laughs> until like, I bring it up <laughs> Just saying there is no pressure and just kind of think um like only I get yeah, again back to the control element of it it's like I've I'm gonna do everything I can do um to get myself into the best position and if that doesn't bring um the best out of me and then like there's nothing else I could have done so mm. yeah for me I'm just like I'm just gonna do everything I can do to put myself in in the best position I can be and just yeah just enjoy it really and t tell us about visualization and some of the work you've been doing around that and, and what you actually visualize and what that looks like. Um, yeah, I think it's one of the things that I've been doing the majority of my life um, anyway. And I've always been really. Yeah. And I don't really know why I ever even started. It, it was just one of those things like when I was younger, I'm, I could clearly remember going to competitions and just kind of like falling asleep in the car, but just um, just visualizing all my events. So obviously I was a heptathlete when I was younger, so I kind of like go through all the events in my head um, and like the, the track and like the crowd and everything and like really got all the emotions in. Um, so yeah, it's something I've been doing from like a really young age and I find it, it's great, um, especially when you know uh, what the arena is going to look like and what the track looks like because then you can really put yourself in that position. So yeah, so for the high jump, I just, um, just visualize myself, obviously, like clearing the bar, um, go through my run up, and yeah, it's quite, it's quite clear. And I think that's one of the things um, going into competition. I just do so much more of, and that's kind of when I know I'm getting into competition phase. When I just keep rehearsing my run up, rehearsing the jump. Do you think it makes a difference to visualize yourself winning and clearing? And do you think it kind of sets your mind up? to do yeah. that with your body does it do you know do you know what I mean yeah, no I know I know yeah. I feel like it definitely does help um it just kind of gets your body into the state that it's already been there before and it's already done it and I guess I kind of use it to help any sort of like competition anxiety um just so I kind of feel like I've been here before I've done it before and it went well um yeah I think that's probably the main the main point of it I think it's interesting as well that you don't just because when I asked you I wouldn't I was thinking more of you visualizing running up and claiming the bar mm -hmm. I didn't think about the fact that you would visualize the crowd and the arena yeah. and the track and the, yeah. you know how much does that help does it just help when you kind of walk in you're not oh my god there's so many people or mm -hmm. um I guess there's that as well um yeah I'm not really sure why that comes into play it's it's weird because I remember um I don't even know if this is true or not but I remember hearing that Jessica Ennis never wants to go into the stadium before um before a major championship because she just wanted to kind of get in there on the day and then just feel all the emotions fresh rather than already be there I know what it looks like I know where the crowd is and I also found that really interesting because mm it's I just kind of thought every athlete thought thought the same way and it's so it's so interesting to know that so many athletes um just go about competitions so differently so yeah, yeah. do you think it influences you then in terms of the emotion in that stadium and and the crowd yeah mm. I guess 
um, it allows you to not get distracted by by the stadium and by the crowd. And obviously, you can use the crowd like uh, for high jump. It's amazing to have a crowd because you get the claps and you get the atmosphere, yeah. and that kind of brings that extra extra level in competition. Um, but obviously, like if you're going to a stadium and not expecting it to be completely packed out and like really loud and you kind of just get encompassed by the atmosphere rather than what you're out there to do so yeah I guess that might be the reason. I know that you um, looked at Dame Kelly Holmes and she or you spoke to her and she gave you a little bit of advice she's somebody that actually when I was younger I massively looked up to and I remember when she won gold and um yeah, yeah I was I, I I was just um a junior athlete like yeah. on the track and I remember looking up to her so much and I and I know that she's spoken to you about the difference between I don't know how much psychology and the mind plays in performance can you talk us through that I don't think we've actually I don't think I've actually had a proper conversation with her before. Right, um, let's sort that out then. <laughs> I know. Um, I've listened to her on a lot of podcasts. Um, I think I might have met her briefly um, a bit when I was a junior athlete. But yeah, she was one of the biggest um, inspirations for me growing up. I think that w seeing her win in Athens was the moment where I was like, I want to be an athlete. Like, yeah. this is amazing. Just seeing how... <laughs> how everyone reacted to her the crowds the public like everyone I was like wow it's absolutely amazing and just seeing how much it meant to her as she crossed the line um yeah I was like wow I'd love to kind of feel that emotion one day so yeah she's, she's a huge huge role model for me growing up. yeah because she talks so much about the mind and about yeah. how it's you know you've got athletes on the start line for example or mm -hmm. you know in the line in competition in high jump and they've all trained to such a high level high level so what's the difference is it is it mind yeah that's the thing that was really interesting to see her say because she was I think I heard her in a podcast and just kind of say that um everyone say for the 800 meters everyone's kind of ran run around the same time and the reason the person who um wins is because it's like 80% of the mind. Um, it's a really interesting one because I guess once you get to that top level, everyone is pretty much on a level playing field in terms yeah. of jumps and their ability. Um, so yeah, I guess it, it kind of has to come down to the mind. It has to come down to you not getting distracted by, by your other competitors and just kind of staying in your lane and just, yeah, just really keeping faith in your ability compared to everyone else's so yeah the mind is a huge huge element of it once you get to that like top top level I know you've been studying psychology so you've had that and um, you're in your final year so you've added that to the pile and everything else of the one minute is a competition one minute is there's not and I can imagine studying's being strange um, but do you implement the things that you learned in psychology into into your life and performance yeah, I do. I think a lot of the things I was doing anyway, I'm now learning about in a way like mental imagery right. and visualization and stuff. Something I just kind of did and didn't really understand the effects of it. Um, and then actually learning about it and like neuroscience and just understanding like the parts of the brains that fire when when you like do imagery. And I think that encourages me to do it more because I actually realize there is like a scientific benefit of it. Um, so yeah, it's been been really interesting um but yeah yeah in final year I've got exams next week and I was kind of hoping I was competing this weekend because I got a 24-hour exam on Monday and I was like oh it would be a rest day but now it's a training day <laughs> <laughs> you got a 24-hour exam yeah it's really weird um it's I think it's because they're remote and people are from are going to be in all different parts of the world right. so they, and rather than just giving us a two-hour exam window they've given us what, a 23-hour exam window instead so yeah it's it's all it's all just really odd at the moment <laughs> I can imagine um and with yourself do you feel do you get any kind of self-doubt or yeah yeah I think I, I've asked so many athletes that and I think everybody says the same thing I, I mean I think everybody does in person as well yeah. how do you combat that because I think when I've worked with young people it tends to be the thing that they ask me and you're kind of like yeah how do you overcome that and yeah. try and like impart advice to somebody who's younger right how do you yeah. deal with it 
Um, I think, obviously I'm not an expert in dealing with it, <laughs> um, but I think the way I try and deal with it. I don't think it, any of us are. <laughs> um, the way I try and deal with it is kind of just looking at the facts and just, so say I'm like, have a bit of doubt going into competition or doubt over, say I've had an injury or something and doubtful that I'm going to come back and be able to train and compete the exact way I want to and have before. Um, yeah, it's just kind of like looking at the facts and just thinking, right, well, I've put myself in a position to do all the training I can and just do everything in my power to make sure it goes well or I could do the best of my ability. I think, mm. um, so like an injury, if you're doubtful, you're going to come back. The main thing is like I'm gonna go to the physio and gonna like get that kind of like external validation as well that I can do it um so yeah, I guess a bit of external um kind of helps as well yeah because it's about whether that that voice in your head sometimes isn't necessarily true it's just yeah. the thing that's doing the what ifs right yeah. but it isn't actually like a fact yeah. and and you mentioned in an earlier answer tathlon you said that's what you did when you were younger um is that something that are you going to stick with high jump now or is that something you're going to look at getting into because I think you know I saw an interview with you a few years ago where you said it was potentially something you were going to do yeah I'm still a little bit undecided like I go through phrases where I'm like I'm definitely going back to tathlon and then I go through phrases where, where I'm like mm, I definitely want to do more than just high jump like I absolutely love it but I think from going from a multi-event background to just one event was hard like and it still is a bit hard because I just love everything in the sport and I feel like I just haven't really fulfilled my potential in other events as well so I'm not sure if I'm definitely going to heptathlon um but I'm definitely going to stick with high jump and then hopefully a few more events with that in the coming years yeah does that affect how you approach high jump though do you know because you kind of like oh you know I feel I should do other things and I've got potential to do more events and because you're you're multi-skilled across different disciplines yeah it's definitely something that has uh has been a problem in the past like um I've kind of say a so the thing with heptathlon is like, obviously you've got seven events. So if one event doesn't go well, you're like, right, okay, on to the next one. Yeah. And it's a really, it's a great mentality because it's not like an all or nothing. It's like, right, okay, I'm going to do as well as I can on this one. If it doesn't go well, oh, well, I've got, I've gone to the next one. If it does go well, great. I've accumulated some great points, but still I've got to go on to the next one. I think mm-hmm. my brain has kind of been wired into that, right, onto the next thing. Whereas in hygiene for competition hasn't gone well. And I think that's why I probably reacted so strongly in over the past few years to like one bad performance is because for me, I'm like, that just feels like the end. Whereas before I was like, right, okay, I've got six other events to kind of um, rectify myself. So yeah, I think it has in the past, but now I'm just thinking, right, okay, I'm just putting everything I can in high jump um, and yeah that's kind of like the main thing so yeah I've definitely got better better at it that makes complete sense you know when you were talking through it because obviously you've done that from a young age whereas I think it'd probably be different if you went from like a single discipline to Mm -hmm. doing seven different ones yeah um so looking towards Tokyo Mm -hmm. it must be it must be hard for you how are you viewing it because some people are saying that they're just blocking it out of their head that it might not happen and some are preparing for that so then it's not a surprise if it doesn't yeah um yeah it's such a hard one like again this week yeah. when everything was cancelled there was then more speculation about Tokyo and I think the headline was like government official says that Tokyo is 100% been cancelled and they're preparing for 2032 and I was like yeah, I saw that. <laughs> it was just such a hard thing to hear and I think it, it was on quite reputable news sources as well so it wasn't just like some random tweet like fake news um so yeah it was that was like I hadn't even I mean obviously the thought had gone through my head like it may not be on this summer and the closer we're getting to it and the worse the situation kind of is kind of getting the more people are thinking is it going to happen is it not going to happen but I guess for me, I'm like, that's just wasted energy. Just thinking of having to think about, is it not gonna happen? Is it gonna happen? It's just wasted energy. So for me, I'm just like, right, I'm just gonna do everything I can to 
I mean, first year I haven't even qualified yet. So for me, I'm like, right, the first thing I need to do is qualify for it. Um, there's no point just carrying on talking about an Olympics if I'm not even on, well, hopefully going to be there. But um, that's probably my first priority. Um, but yeah, in my head, I'm like, it's 100% going to happen. I know that might be a bit like, people be like, oh, but it's not 100% going to happen. I'm like, I, I obviously know it's 100 I obviously know it's not 100%, but for me, it's so much easier to go through training and go through competitions thinking that it is definitely going to happen. Yeah, you've got to have that in, in your brain so yeah. you give it everything. Yeah. You talked about qualifying. So how's that going to work mm. um, because the competitions keep dropping in the lead up? And how important is it to have competition in the lead up? Yeah, I think that's that's the hard thing because like I kind of felt in a really good position to um compete and hopefully like the qualifying is one centimeter below my pb um so it's going to be it's going to be like tough to to jump it but i kind of feel like i'm in a position where i've been doing everything i can to kind of get me there so yeah that's the kind of the next battle is because it's not on me it's not on my ability now it's on i can i get access to a competition and we've got a european indoor champs this uh this indoors as well. We've got that in March. Um, so obviously we need to qualify for that as well. And the qualifying for European indoors is, is, is the exact same height as it is for the Olympics. So again, that's gonna be, it's gonna be a push and it's gonna be, um, yeah, we need the competitions. We need the opportunities to allow us to, um, <laughs> to qualify. And luckily for um, field events, you can qualify indoors as well. Um, whereas obviously like in 100 meters you can't do 100 indoors so for us we're quite lucky that if we jump it indoors it does count for an outdoor qualifier as well so yeah hopefully these opportunities will crop up um, so just got to keep keep ready for when they when they eventually do you know Morgan you said um, I know I've still got qualified yet and you know it's going to be a push but do you really in your heart of heart know that you are going to qualify I hope I am <laughs> Like, I hope I am. I think there's a lot of things. I've had a really good winter's training, so I'm just, like, really happy with how that's gone. Um, and it's gone, yeah, it's gone well. So I'm, like, I'm hoping that I can qualify and obviously thinking, like, if, if the day goes well, that I can. Um, obviously, nothing's nothing's certain, but, yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I know you can't you probably don't want to kind of put it out there too much um what do you think do you think that you know hopefully the athlete that will turn up you know providing you qualify and it goes ahead in Tokyo is different than the one that would have turned up last year at 2020 in terms of what you've learned over lockdown because yeah. I at the very beginning of conversation you mentioned you know the lack of facilities which I think yeah. is must be so much harder for a high jumper yeah. than somebody who's a runner because of the skill involved in what in what you do how much have you learned during that period and what what's the difference in the athlete and the person yeah. you know the Morgan Lake that turn would have turned up in 2020 to the one that will turn up hopefully in 2021 yeah I feel like completely different I think after after Doha I was pretty burnt out and I was just kind of like questioning if I still wanted to kind of like do the sport and do high jump anymore I was just really I was just so so upset by that 2019 year I think because it starts on such a high I jumped 197 in my first competition um and I was like right it's going to be the best year and then it kind of just had injuries and family things and I was like this is just this has just not been the year I thought it was going to be. Um, and yeah, after after Doha, I was just like, okay, I just feel completely burnt out. But I was like, I just need to be in Tokyo. Like whatever happens, I just need to be there. And every session, it was all about, it was literally all about the Olympics. Every, I was just wasn't really enjoy, enjoying training. Everything was just very pressurized. And yeah, everything was just kind of like a push um, just so I could, qualify and make the team um whereas once it got postponed and things kind of settled a bit I had such a different mentality going into this winter I was it just like I just want to enjoy training again I just want to enjoy competing um and just not put pressure on myself and I think that's allowed me to have a like a really good indoor um, winter training period because I've just yeah I've just kind of like really enjoyed my training and just been a lot a lot more relaxed attitude going 
the prospect of the Olympics. I'm like, I'm just going to do whatever I can. And if that equates to a qualifying, if that equates to the Olympics, then that's amazing. And like, obviously that's, that is my ultimate aim to, to be there um, this year. But yeah, just not putting that same amount of pressure on myself has been really important. Yeah, that's understandable. And you, you can see if how after that performance in Doha, you kind of had those questions, but then also it was almost like, well, now I'm going to prove it in, yeah. in Tokyo. What made you go, oh, no, I'm, I do want to do this and, and I am going to continue? What do you think it was? What drives think, you? Yeah, I think it was just kind of time, to be honest. I think... Um, it was it was hard because straight after Tokyo was such um, Doha was such a late championships in the season. So usually you kind of peak around August time, and I think it was late September, early October, yeah. Doha, and then you had a really short um, winter training block straight into indoors, and everything just felt so rushed and like you never really got a break. So for me, I felt like I never really deloaded and just kind of had that had that break to kind of love the sport again and love the event again. Um, so I think having a bit of time off and just that um, when the world kind of stopped in lockdown one and just having that reflection on the sport and just how much I loved it that was probably um, what brought it back again yeah because I imagine you don't get a lot of time and that was almost like forced time I think on a lot of us as well um, so to wrap us up what would you say to any young athlete out there as advice mm-hmm <sighs> Probably the main bit of advice, um, it's kind of advice I'm giving myself now, it's just kind of enjoy yourself and just enjoy every minute of it and just do as much as you can. Um, when I was younger, I just did every sport I could, just did netball, tennis, hockey, everything I could do and just kind of found the enjoyment in sport and then specialised as I got older. So I think, yeah, the main thing is just to enjoy it and make that the priority and then kind of like specialise in what you want to down the road. How did you get into um, heptathlon then, high jump then, if you did so many different sports? How did you narrow it down? Um, so I got into heptathlon. Um, yeah, I was kind of like, I was doing a lot of sports, but athletics was always the one that I enjoyed the most. Um, so I probably, I was doing swimming quite a lot, but obviously that was quite like taxing on my body, like waking up early mornings and swimming and then trying to do athletics in the evening. Like it was just, they just didn't complement each other. So I stopped swimming and just was mostly just doing netball and athletics. And then um, the athletics was always the route I wanted to go down. And obviously had to happen just being so demanding. I was like, I'm going to have to stop netball at this point and just carry on with athletics. Um, and yeah, I was doing heptathlon and multi-events until until Tokyo, I was actually trying to qualify, um, Tokyo, till Rio. Um, I was trying to qualify for the heptathlon in Rio, um, but I didn't I didn't make it that year and obviously got there for the high jump instead. Um, and then ever since then, I've been doing high jump at the major championships, still kind of doing heptathlon training. Um, but in 2018, I decided just to focus on the high jump and hope to come back to heptathlon at some point. And, and what advice would you give to anyone out there at the moment that, I don't know, maybe goalposts are moving quite a lot, mm. things are really uncertain. I think that's a lot of us at the yeah. moment. Um, would it be, is there anything else other than control the controllables that you've learned in your time as an athlete so far, very young athlete, and also with the performance mind coach, or is control the controllables the one thing that you would advise people? Um, yeah, obviously that, but also, I guess, having smaller goals as well, not just having that huge um, long-term goal, just having small short-term goals so you can kind of feel like you're achieving things on the way to that big goal. Um, yeah. And it can, that can literally be anything. Um, so I think that's quite a nice way of looking at it and just, yeah, just kind of feeling like you still are accomplishing things and you still are making progress, even if um, the bigger kind of goals are changing in a way. yeah that makes complete sense I do exactly the same thing yeah otherwise I think you're kind of so focused on the big fat mission at the end yeah. of it aren't you yeah. that yeah. you know you, you don't realize the steps to get up to there and one final thing I have to ask you um I normally finish on that question but mm-hmm. what goes through your mind mm-hmm. when you do hear that <laughs> and then it gets quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker <laughs> Is anything go through your mind when you're about to jump? Um, 
so before I jump, I guess that the claps and the extra energy, I'm like, you just kind of feel like everyone wants you to clear the bar and it's just like, <laughs> everyone is there helping you. So yeah, the claps are really, really important because it just, yeah, it gets the extra energy levels and just everyone, you just kind of feel like everyone's backing you. Everyone wants you to, to succeed. And it's like, yeah, a really nice environment. Good. Did you like my attempt at yeah. trying to do it? <laughs> Thanks so much for your time, Morgan. It's been absolutely great to speak to you. Thank you so much. I'll give you a, a little clip now. And then um, good luck as well. Thank you. And I hope that you, I'm sure you will call the fan. I really hope that it does go ahead. Um, and good luck as well for Europe. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Morgan. I hope you're enjoying the series so far and you enjoyed listening to Morgan there. And there's loads more episodes coming up. Make sure to subscribe so they go straight into your podcast feed. And remember to visit sportinglife.com ahead of the rest when it comes to unbiased opinion and sport analysis. Thanks again for listening. Take care and we'll speak very soon.